Uh, the topic uh, today, uh, which uh, Santa Monica uh, Assembly has honored me with the invitation to discuss this particular topic, um, is uh, uh, Tablets of a Divine Plan, which is uh, a collection of uh, 14, and there may be even more, but at least 14 tablets, uh, 14 letters written by Abdul Baha uh, in 1916 and 1917. And uh, I called the title of the talk from the World War to, uh, to the World Peace. Uh, so in my talk, I'm trying to locate the tablets of divine plan in terms of um, two different contexts. Uh, in a sense, two different forms of trinity. So tablets of divine plan become simultaneously one unit uh, of two different types of trinities which are related to each other. Uh, let me first discuss briefly the second trinity, and then I'll come back to the first trinity. Uh, the second trinity is uh, really the ministry of the guardian of, of Shoghi Effendi. Shoghi Effendi was uh, appointed by Abdul Baha as uh, the successor of Abdul Baha and the leader of the Baha'i faith, the guardian of the Baha'i faith. And the entire ministry of Shoghi Effendi was uh, determined and shaped by his understanding of sacred writings of Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha and choosing three specific texts an interpretation of these three texts, and so the, by Trinity I mean these three specific texts, uh, which define the outline for the plan of uh, Shoghi Effendi and the entire ministry of, of, of the Guardian. These three texts are tablets of, tablet of Carmel, uh, tablet, uh, the will and testament of Abdul Baha, and of course, Tablets of Divine Plan. So Tablets of Divine Plan is one of the three works that, that Guardian chose, uh, made it the center of his understanding of his ministry, and on the basis of that interpretation, he guided Baha'i community in certain ways. Uh, Will and Testament of Abdul Baha, to a large extent, uh, specified the nature and structure and characteristics of the Baha'i community, the leadership and governance of the Baha'i community. It was a very important uh, principle for what the Guardian defined as the formative age of the Baha'i faith. The formative age is the age in which Baha'i institutions would develop. So not only we would have individual Baha'is who would have a new form of worldview and morality and sentiments, but in addition we would have new institutions, these collective institutions of the Baha'i faith, uh, construction and development of these institutions primarily become the question of the formative age of the Baha'i faith, which becomes a vehicle for, um, uh, for changing and transforming the world in the light of Baha'i ideals and values and principles, which then we would have the golden age. The charismatic stage of the Baha'i faith, which the Guardian calls it the heroic age or apostolic age, so it is really the prophetic stage of the Baha'i faith, or, or in sociological language, the charismatic stage of the Baha'i faith, that consists of the Bab of Baha'u'llah and, and Abdul Baha. So Guardian understood his mission as primarily a point of transition. He was the individual leader of the Baha'i faith, appointed by Abdul Baha. But he understood the, he, himself and the mission of, uh, of his ministry as a point of transition. Namely, he did not identify himself as a charismatic 
uh, element of the heroic age of the Baha'i faith. Uh, he was the beginning of the formative age of the Baha'i faith, namely the age in which Baha'i institutions would come into existence. Shogh Efendi became the mediating point between individual charismatic leadership, which was Abdul Baha, Baha'u'llah, and the Baha, and development of democratic institutions which would govern the Baha'i faith. And it is for that reason that although Shogh Efendi was the individual leader of the Baha'i faith, he intentionally acted in ways that he would not be understood as a charismatic leader. For instance, he would not go to different places, give public talks, uh, or when the pilgrims would come to the Holy Land, he would emphasize that they are there in order to see the shrine of the Bab, shrine of Baha'u'llah, and not to see the guardian. So guardian intentionally trained the Baha'is to define that age, not the age of individual leadership of the guardian, but rather as the mission to construct and create the democratic institutions that Baha'u'llah had predicted in his writings. Will and Testament of Abdul Baha gives the blueprint and the structure of these institutions, which you know at the local levels are the democratic institutions, which at this moment we call it local spiritual assembly, but in the future they will be called houses of justice. And then there is the national uh, units, the national spiritual assemblies. And at the top of that would be the global democratic institution, which is the Universal House of Justice. And so the purpose of the ministry of Shoghi Afendi was development, creation, enhancement, and maturation of these institutions. So that ultimately these institutions, these democratic institutions would replace the age of individual leadership uh, of the Baha'i faith, which was the original stages. But at the same time, for these institutions to come into existence, it was necessary that there would be Baha'is in different parts of the world. For local spiritual assemblies to come into existence, it was needed that there would be sufficient number of Baha'is in different localities. For national spiritual assemblies to come into existence, it was necessary that there would be enough local spiritual assemblies and enough number of Baha'is within a country. And for Universal House of Justice to become a possibility, it was necessary that Baha'i faith becomes sufficiently global. And that meant that the presence of these national spiritual assemblies, namely viable Baha'i communities, in many different parts of the world. And that was the, uh, the outline uh, of the ministry of, of Shoghi Effendi, the way he understood it. So in order to realize this precondition for the development of the Baha'i institutions, he emphasized tablets of divine plan. So tablets of divine plan becomes the blueprint for uh, a, a diffusion uh, of the um, message uh, of Baha'u'llah, of the divine fragrance uh, of uh, of Baha'u'llah's revelation in mystical language from Torah to the Quran to the Islamic mysticism and so on, the word of God is expression of a fragrance, is the expression of the breath of the merciful. So when God wants to create the reality, it is the breath of, of God, this, this air which takes the form of word. And so it is expressed as a word. And through that word of God, reality comes into existence. And a spiritual culture also comes into existence. This emphasis on Baha'i teaching, teaching activities as diffusing the fragrance of God and so on, has this mystical connotation. Uh, it's in hidden words of Abdul, in hidden words of Baha'u'llah also, in one of his uh, hidden words, 
he emphasizes that we have to um, we have to renounce our self and then to be filled uh, with the uh, with the breath of uh, of God, nafas rahmani. It's one of the Persian hidden words. In any case, uh, so tablets of divine plan would uh, define the method and the path and the inspiration and motivation for the Baha'is traveling to different parts of the world or uh, migrating to different parts of the world and spreading the message of Baha'u'llah. The, the two become inseparable and necessary parts of each other. And the two of them are, of course, under the inspiration of a spiritual conception uh, of reality and life. And the animating expression of that, of course, for Shoghi Afandi was Tablet of Carmel. In the Tablet of Carmel, Baha'u'llah, who was a realization of the prophecies of, uh, of the Bible, of old religions, arriving uh, on Mount Carmel, and so realizing the presence of God, coming of, of God, coming of the day of God, the splendor and glory of the Lord appearing in the Holy Land and so on, that moment, and the Tablet of Carmel is a, is a, is a discourse of love. The mountain is not a dead entity. It is a living entity who is a lover. It's a lover who was anxious for uh, um, overcoming uh, separation and alienation and embracing the beloved. And now the beloved has come. And there is this discourse of love between Baha'u'llah and the Mount Carmel. This is, this is a spiritual force, which of course the symbols of that becomes, uh, becomes uh, the presence of the remains of the Bab on Mount Carmel and the and uh, Shoghi Effendi interpreting the Tablet of Carmel because in the Tablet of Carmel, Baha'u'llah talks about uh, the Ark of God um, emerging on Mount Carmel. And he says that as it was mentioned in the Book of Names, in Kitab al-Asma. That Kitab al-Asma is not the book of the Bab, which is famous as the book of names, or Kitab al-Asma. Bahá'u'lláh is using it as the abbreviation of the book Qayyum al-Asma. He means the commentary on the Surah of Joseph. It is in the, in the commentary of the Surah of Joseph, or the book Qayyum al-Asma. Asma Bahá'u'lláh, the tablet of Carmel means Qayyum al-Asma, but he just means Kitab al-Asma where the Bab talks about the people of Baha and the uh, Crimson Ark and the beautiful statements uh, which he makes about that. And the Guardian interpreted this as the institution of the Universal House of Justice. And therefore, from that, he interpreted that the seat of the Universal House of Justice is going to be on Mount Carmel. So Mount Carmel becomes a symbolic expression of that spiritual force and, and the center for global spiritual uh, but administrative institution of the Baha'i faith, which would guide development of these institutions. So you see that the tablets of the divine plan is central in the ministry of Shoghi Effendi. It was the spiritual genius of Shoghi Effendi that among all these tablets of Baha'u'llah, the Bab, Abdul Baha, and, Cho, and so on, he chose these three texts. Nobody would have thought that these three texts have a particular significance, different from other tablets and so on. 
the greatest act of interpretation of the Shori Effendi was just focusing and choosing these three texts out of multitudes of divine texts and then interpreting them in particular consistent interrelated fashions which would define the, the history of the formative age and, and the events uh, which are uh, necessary steps for the future of the Baha'i faith. But before this, there was another trinity. And I'm going to emphasize a little bit that trinity. The trinity refers to tablets of Abdul Baha during the time of World War. World War I, you know, was between 1814 and 18, uh, 1914 and 1918. And Abdul Baha just returned from his trip to Africa, Europe, and North America. He spent more time in, in Africa, in Egypt, than either Europe or, or North America. But it was a global travel which was very, very important step for globalization of the Baha'i faith. But Abdul Baha defined these travels primarily as a travel in order to promote the cause of peace. This is the way he himself defined it. And he was aware that the, the world, particularly Europe, is moving towards a global war. And he was constantly warning people in, the, in Europe, in the United States, in Canada about that. Um, and of course, uh, it was people did not uh, uh, listen to the wisdom that Abdul Baha shared. And the consequence of that is that when he, Abdul Baha returns, December of 1913, he returns to Haifa from his travels. And uh, Soon after that, we have uh, the beginning of World War I. Abdullah wanted, after these travels, to go to India and China and do the same thing that he did in North America, Europe, and so in, in China and India. But the war prevented that. And after that, also, he was too weak and too ill. And soon after that, in 1921, he passed away. But during this time, namely the immediate years of war and the few succeeding years immediately after the war, which was still the age of settlement of the question of the war, uh, Abdul Baha used this time for uh, engaging in very uh, important uh, uh, spiritual and, and social activities. And the heart of this for me, and this is my understanding of the issue, is this uh, trinity that I'm going to talk about it. Namely, um, three works of Abdul Baha are symbols and reflections of the general message that he was conveying to the world at this moment. Again, Tablets of Divine Plan is one of these works. The other two works, one is Tablet to uh, Forel, uh, a Swiss uh, scientist, almost philosopher, almost social scientist, but primarily a natural scientist, who had a very contradictory worldview. On the one hand, he believed in Darwinism and social Darwinism. On the other hand, he had this very beautiful egalitarian loving ideas about uh, humanity and oneness of humanity and necessity of peace and so on. I think he never was aware sufficiently of the contradiction between these two uh, principles that simultaneously uh, he was believing in. Um, of course, this is before becoming influenced by Tablet of Forel. But in any case, uh, Tablet of Forel is one of these works. And uh, the other work is the tablet that Abdul Baha wrote to the Hague Central Peace Committee. So this 
three works. A tablet that he sends to a committee which uh, uh, Tezar of Russia had initiated for uh, creating some discourse for peace, uh, at least among the European states, and was, was active, and they were doing some good things. Um, they wrote a letter to Abdul Baha, and Abdul Baha wrote in response this particular tablet. It's a very, very important tablet. And then there is the tablet of Forel, and there is then tablets of divine plan. Uh, these three tablets are inseparable from each other, and all of them are oriented towards the fundamental principle and goal of Abdul Baha's uh, worldview and Baha'i faith, namely elimination of the culture of violence and creation of a culture and institutions which would lead to and promote world peace. So briefly, in terms of the connection and relation between these two, Tablet of Forel becomes the spiritual principle and background, the groundwork for, for all these uh, works and the messages. Tablet of Forel primarily argues for a spiritual interpretation of reality. The whole Tablet of Forel, as you know, he, Forel didn't believe in God. Uh, he had these spiritual sentiments, and on the social principles of the Baha'i faith, he was very sympathetic, but he didn't believe in soul, human soul, and he didn't believe in God. So Tablet of Forel is written in order to emphasize a spiritual interpretation of reality, that reality is not a materialistic, mechanistic entity. Reality is ultimately a spiritual principle. And this is the foundation of the concept of peace that Baha'u'llah uh, Baha discussed and Abdul Baha now is promoting and, and elaborating. One of the very important issues which is emphasized in uh, this work is Abdul Baha's emphasis that not only laws are uh, products of the necessary relations arising from the nature of things, but he emphasizes that if you look more uh, deeply, you would see that these, uh, these realities of things are all interdependent and none of them exist without the other ones. In other words, Abdul Baha, as part of that discussion of the spiritual interpretation of reality, is emphasizing the principle of unity in diversity at the metaphysical level. All reality, including natural reality, are interdependent. It is not the case that we have things who have a nature, and these natures or these realities of things are solid, separate, independent from each other, so that laws would be expressions of the relations among the two. For Abdul Baha, as he explains there, this is the, the, um, the appearance which at first, um, this is the conception that we would have of, of uh, even material reality. But he says if you uh, look more closely and deeper, then you'll see that the reality of everything is depending on realities of every other thing, that they are mutually dependent from, uh, on each other. And so this conception that the identity, reality of nothing is independent from the totality of reality, that ultimately everything is one and the same, and nothing exists without other things. So others are actually present Within, um, within the entity itself. This uh, mutual, so there is no, even at the level of material reality, there is no real otherness. Uh, everything is one and the same, it, it is itself. Uh, it, it appears in the 
form of difference, but, but ultimately everything is one and the same. But everything is one and the same ultimately because everything is a spiritual. Everything is a reflection of God. And God becomes the concept which becomes justification of the fact and proof of the fact and the ground of the fact that all reality ultimately are one and the same. In the writings of uh, Baha'u'llah, he always contrasts two Persian words with each other, which is impossible to translate it in English. I mean, it's very easy to translate it in English, but it is impossible to understand the subtlety of the linguistic play at the Persian level. One is yeganegi and one is biganegi. For instance, in the famous statement of Baha'u'llah, he says that the tabernacle of unity has been raised, this is tabernacle of yeganegi, which is unity. And from that he concludes that therefore we should not look at each other as a strangers, with the eyes of a strangers. We should not, and that word is bechashme biganegi yektigar ramabinit. This estrangement is biganegi. Unity is yeganegi. But Baha'u'llah particularly plays with these words because these two words are the same words. The difference is that um, if you have yeganegi and then you just add a B, a letter B, before that, add that to it, then yeganegi becomes biganegi. In hidden words, Baha'u'llah, as uh, uh, one of the forms of addressing people, he says, Ey bigane ba yegane. We I'm sure we, many of you who read this in original Persian have hundreds of times have seen this. But uh, next time, pay attention to the subtleties of this. And the Guardian has translated it, um, O befriended stranger, which is very strange at first. It appears a very strange translation. Befriended a stranger. The original is begone by yegane. At first, begane by yegane means a stranger from the one, which represents the unity. Begane by yegane is, they are two, they are the same words, just one B is added to the other one. But when you pay attention more, what Bahala is saying that you are a stranger from yegane. But just as the linguistically they are actually the same, but Bahala is saying that although you are a stranger from the Yegane, from the one, but in fact the one is with you. So a bigane by Yegane also means oh now that you are a stranger. And yet, the one is with you. Not just stranger from the one, but a stranger with the one. The one is with you. Yegane, the, the one, the absolute one, is with you. And that then, <clears throat> the beautiful play with the words, a bigane, Ba yegane, it's B and Ba. B in Persian means negation, and Ba means affirmation and witness. And so you take the word yegane, at first is with B, which negates, bigane, which then makes it a stranger. But immediately that same person is Ba yegane. A bigane, Ba yegane. There's no way that any of these complexities ever can be translated into any language. 
the way that the Guardian has translated it as befriended stranger is really translation genius because it, it gives you that, that concept that you, you are a stranger, but although you are a stranger, you are befriended. The beloved, the one is with you, um, is calling you, is the ground of your being, is supporting you, is sustaining you, and yet you don't understand it. You, you are a stranger. Anyway, I was not, I had no intention of discussing what I just discussed. <laughs> <clears throat> Words have their own logic and life, and uh, rarely I have control over them. <laughs> so, um, I mentioned that because the basic point of Baha'i conception of God, of a spiritual definition of reality, is this principle of yeganegi, oneness, unity, that everything is one. That's why the tabernacle of unity has been raised. This is that reality is one, and also humanity is one. And this is the age that humanity now needs to become conscious and aware of this unity, and then translate this unity into the form of social institutions, transforming the world, which would correspond to that unity. It's not enough that you would have this mystical idea that we are all one. Very good. Many of the mystics have said that. But that is not sufficient. You now have to translate that awareness of unity into creation of a world which becomes the mirror of that unity. So tablet of 4L becomes expression of this fundamental spiritual condition for emergence of peace. Abdul Baha in all his writings, including both tablet of 4L and the tablet that he writes addressing the Hague Central Peace Committee, he emphasizes that what creates ultimately war is prejudice. And he defines prejudice as equivalent of the law of struggle for existence at the level of nature. Each one of these statements are sociologically and philosophically really new horizons for philosophical and social thinking. So Abdul Ba's writings become critique of social Darwinism, not Darwinian theory as a scientific biological theory, but as a sociological and philosophical theory. Namely, a theory which reduces humans to the level of jungle, sees humans just as materialistic entities, and therefore the relations among humans in different aspects of their life should be regulated on the basis of the principle of a struggle for existence. Whether it is colonialism at the level of international relations and war of everybody every, against everybody, or extremes of competition and cruelty and inequality at the level of markets, all forms of racism in terms of relation of different ethnic groups or race groups and the like, these are all different expressions of social Darwinism. War becomes agent of progress. We want to have progress, we have to engage in war. Cruelty becomes virtue. The point of Abdul Baha is that a spiritual interpretation of reality is needed so that we discover that we are not just an animal. We, so that we discover that the world is ultimately spiritual and human reality ultimately is the kingdom of a spirit. Once we define ourselves as a spiritual beings, as citizens of the realm of the kingdom of a spirit, then we recognize that we are all one and the same. Because we are all images of God. We are all reflections of God. So we are one and the same. This consciousness of unity, this tabernacle of unity that Baha'u'llah emphasizes, is a reflection, according to Abdul Baha, of the spiritual interpretation of reality. Without this spiritual interpretation of reality, ultimately the quest for peace would become problematic. So Tablet of Forel becomes a foundation, spiritual foundation for this 
transforming the world from World War I and World War in general into world peace. The second document out of the Trinity becomes Tablet of Abdel Baha, Abdel Studi, a Hague Central uh, Committee for Peace. It's a magnificent tablet. Abdel Baha starts by saying that this is written during the time of war. He says that because of this war, everybody uh, in the world has become conscious and is now believing that war is, a, is an evil thing, it's not a good thing, and that peace is good. This is very important because for most stages of human life, uh, our cultures in different ways, and our philosophers and intellectuals in different ways, actually had glorified war. Hegel, the greatest philosopher that you can imagine, he has such beautiful ideas, such great ideas. But that same philosopher with that depth of thought and creativity, when it comes to the question of war, he finds war the ultimate expression of virtue. In war of one nation against another nation, you are sacrificing yourself for the good of the, uh, for the good of society. And so for him, this becomes the ultimate expression of morality. Universal becomes society, becomes nation, and therefore war in which you are going to sacrifice your life becomes the ultimate act of negation of individualism and individuality for affirmation of universalism. Nobody was there to say to Hegel, you are such a great philosopher, but when I'm trying to sacrifice my life, this is not just to affirm my love for my country. I am killing the other people. I'm killing and eliminating other nations. And so this is not sacrificing for a, a universal. I'm taking a particularism and worshiping a particularism which is at the expense of the universal, namely human race. It's the essence. War is the essence of particularism. War is the essence of reduction of humans to the level of animals. We renounce our humanity, our spiritual, our moral characteristics when we engage in this form of culture, culture of violence. That was just an example I gave you. I mean, the, the idea that war is natural colonialism. Right now, everywhere you say, you say colonialism, imperialism. Everybody knows that it's a bad thing. Everybody. This is a new development. You go 100 years back and then go throughout different philosophical, religious, uh, uh, poetic, artistic expressions in different parts of the world. All of them consider colonialism as something natural. Different countries, different places of the world are fighting with each other. If you have power, you, of course you have to go and take over. This was the virtue and this was the honor. Nobody questioned it, nobody thought it is, it is a bad thing. But now we live in a different world and new ideas are emerging and these ideas are spiritual ideas. But the world is a schizophrenic. We are moving towards a spiritual culture but at the same time we think that these ideas, universalistic ideas, rejection of colonialism, rejection of sexism, rejection of racism, at the, at the same time, these spiritual principles and spiritualization, we normally take it as affirmation of a materialistic culture and philosophy. And of course, it is the exact opposite. So, Abdullah starts by saying that Um, the war has made everybody to, to desire peace right now. But then he says something different. 
He says, however, real peace requires unity of vejdan. Vahdat vejdan lazim. This is difficult to translate because vejdan simultaneously means conscience and consciousness. It's both. But if you translate it, you have to say either conscience or consciousness. I think the way it is translated is consciousness. But the word vahdat vejdan, unity of vejdan, means unity of consciousness and conscience. And this is very important, namely not only your mental, uh, intellectual, rational ideas have to change and there should be a unity in that realm, in the world, but also the realm of values, the realm of conscience, the realm of moral orientation and values, that also have to change and, and, and a unity has to be created. So he says, however, for realization of peace, we need unity of consciousness, unity of conscience. And if you don't read the work of Abdul Ba seriously, the immediate impression that you have is that this was a contradiction. At first, Abdul Ba said that the whole world now has consensus because of this war, that war is a bad thing. And now it says, but this is not sufficient to realize peace because peace requires unity of consciousness, unity of conscience. But there is no contradiction. What Abdul Baha is saying, and that's the heart of the whole matter, is that just saying that I dislike war and I like peace is not sufficient for realization of peace. You cannot say that I like, the, I like peace, but do not question patriarchy and we would have peace. It's impossible to have peace when you, have, you are not questioning the culture of patriarchy and the violence which comes with it. Just saying, I love peace, war is bad. It's not sufficient. You cannot say that I like peace, but do not question extreme forms of chauvinistic nationalism and colonialism and imperialism. If you don't question these institutions, there is no possibility of peace, even though you, you are convinced that war is a terrible thing. If you don't question economic and social injustice in the world, there is no way that lasting peace can be realized, even if you have come to the idea that war is a bad thing. And this is the point that Abdul Baha is raising. Abdul Baha is saying that for peace to be realized, we need a new culture, a new agreement and consensus on principles and values with regard to a number of institutions in the world and transformations in terms of regulation of politics, economy, culture, international relations and the like, that without consensus on these issues together, real peace is not possible. It's very important that we want peace, but that's only just the beginning step. And then in order to explain this, he says that's why Baha'u'llah has brought these teachings which are necessary for creation and construction of peace in the world. And then he gives the list of fundamental teachings of uh, <clears throat> Baha'u'llah, like men and women should be equal, international relations have to change, question of economic justice. He emphasizes so much elimination of all kinds of prejudice. Because for him, prejudice, as I mentioned, is expression, application of the law of struggle uh, for existence. That principle at the level of society and culture becomes prejudice. Prejudice means for Abdul Baha, and this is the way it is, again, translation becomes impossible. The word is ta'asub, which we normally say elimination of prejudice. But ta'asub is not prejudice. Prejudice is one expression of ta'asub. Ta'asub is from the word ospa. It's an Arabic term. Ospa means group. Ta'asub is that form of identity which reduces itself to a particularistic group. Total reduction and identification of self with one group and therefore looking at other groups as strangers or enemies, that is Tasso. And of course, once you identify yourself with just one group and the others, you could see them as strangers or, or uh, enemies, 
then in your judgments you become partial. Namely, in, in judgment about everything, you take the needs, the viewpoints, the interests of your group as rational, moral, superior, natural, ideal, godly, and you take the views, ideas, interests, needs of other groups as unimportant. Prejudice, as we understand it, is an effect of the concept that Abdul Baha is talking about it. So it is rooted, this elimination of all kinds of prejudice, in a call for a new form of identity which is based upon unity in diversity. A unity which is a spiritual unity, which is all embracing unity. There is no other. Everything is I. And the I, as this individual self, is eliminated, is renounced. And I become filled with the breath of God. Because my discussion is not really discussion about the details of Baha'i conception of peace and so on, I won't discuss the details of these principles that Abdul Baha is discussing in this tablet. And as the last element of my talk today, now we go to the third element of the Trinity. So the first element of the Trinity at the time of Abdul Baha, one was tablet of forever which emphasized a spiritual interpretation of reality. That's the only way that we really can go from the culture of violence in a lasting fashion towards a culture of peace. The second one, tablet uh, of uh, Abdul Baha, uh, address to the Hague Peace Committee, gives us particular steps that should be taken, transforming people, transforming institutions at the national level, at the international level, at the political level, cultural level, religious level, and so on, so that peace can be achieved. There is one thing left now, and that's the fact that already has Abdul Baha referred to that. Namely, because of the World War I, people have become ready for peace. People have discovered for the first time that war is a bad thing and that peace is required. However, realization of this idea is just a potentiality. It's not sufficient for realization of peace. For this, in order to become a reality, it is needed that the culture of peace then not just saying that peace is good, but moving towards that unity of consciousness and, and conscience. That culture of peace now should be spread throughout the world. The world after all saw that it is ready. And so the message of Baha'u'llah now has a receptive, uh, globally, a receptive uh, base. And for that reason, he writes his letters addressed to the Baha'is of North America, United States, and Canada in 14 tablets, and asks them to rise up, not only within North America, but also travel all over the world, and spread the message of, of peace, that culture of peace, not just saying peace is good, war is bad emphasizing the principle of oneness of humanity, emphasizing the principle of equality of men and women, emphasizing question of socioeconomic justice and the like, elimination of prejudices, a new conception and interpretation of religion so that religion, instead of becoming the cause of enmity and hate and war, um, it becomes a factor which would bring hearts together. And so he writes these works, uh, and these works are written short tablets. They are not long tablets. Uh, if you read them first in a very superficial fashion, you think there is nothing very important happening in these tablets, very basic statements that people should rise up and teach the faith. 
Um, but that's the style of Abdul Baha that everything that he discusses, he discusses them in a very easy, accessible way, but there are layers and layers of complexity in his writings. If you allow me in, uh, in an schematic fashion, really, I'll talk about the tablets a little bit in 10 minutes or so, and um, and I uh, finish my talk. The, the tablets are addressed to the Baha'is of North America, and the reason is clear. The reason was that no other community at that time was able uh, to have financial possibilities for moving towards migrating to different parts of the world and so on, nor had the political freedom necessary for such, such actions. Baha'is of Iran could not, or Baha'is in the Middle East, none of them could, uh, could engage in this at that moment. And in Europe, there were too few Baha'is. So the only place that was the logical place to emphasize, of course, was the United States and Canada. And uh, in the second stage, in the stage of Shoghi Afandi, he emphasized tablets of divine plan, but now it was not addressed just to the Baha'is of North America, it was addressed to entire humanity. And so it was the same principle, but he wanted then that all Baha'is, including Baha'is of Iran, to rise up and travel and so on. So it's the same principle at a different time in a different situation. Uh, a few basic points about uh, these uh, tablets. Um, first of all, uh, the tablets are emphasizing the unity of the East and the West. This is present in all of these 14 tablets of Abdul Baha. I give you a few examples. The first example is that almost in any tablet that Abdul Baha writes, in order to convey his message, he uses a statement from the Bible, and at the same time he uses a statement from the Quran. And this is completely intentional. Almost any tablet, he, he makes sure that there is a statement from the Bible, mostly from gospel, but in general from the Bible, but also he brings one statement from the Quran. And he's simultaneously, he's bringing East and the West together. And at the same time, he's overcoming otherization which was being done either by Muslims with regard to the Westerners or by the Westerners with regard to the Muslims. Um, by quoting Quran, of course, he, for the Baha'is who are Canadian and American, um, who, this is 100 years ago, 2016, I mean, 1916, it was different from now, that for instance, Los Angeles would have so many Iranians and so many Muslims uh, that uh, Islam would be, to some extent, in some ways, to be uh, recognized by everybody and, to a large extent, intellectuals would, uh, would be very vocal to make sure that Islam would be respected. This is a situation that we have right now. But Abdul Baba was writing this 100 years ago. And at that time, the discourse that existed was a set of very extremely negative ideas about Islam. Abdul Baba, because he wants to create peace, unity in diversity, a global outlook, unity of humanity, unity of all religions, make sure that he brings the statements from the Quran. And he interprets them also in new ways. I think it is in the, in the first tablet that he writes, 
that he quotes the Quranic statement which says um, that land is dry and God sends rain and the consequence of that is that flowers are cultivated and spring out. The way Abdul Baha translates that, he says that this land which was dry is the uh, realm of human culture and orientation which is at the level of a struggle for existence, which is at the level of uh, nature, not recognizing still the spiritual principle. The divine message of peace, of love, is this divine reign. And through this reign, divine message, the realm of nature is transformed into the realm of a spirit and a spiritual perfection emerges. Everything that I was talking about so far, really, all of them are present in this very beautiful interpretation that Abdullah makes of such a simple statement um, that is repeated in Quran in many forms. But at the same time, Abdul Baha is criticizing otherization of Christianity and Judaism by Muslims. He is quoting directly from the Bible, just like his father, who in the book of Certitude, directly quoted from the Bible. That is a new event in the history of Islam and in the history of the Middle East. Muslims believe that Bible is, is corrupted. It's perverted, it's falsified. They believe and still they believe that the existing Bible is not the real Bible. There was a real Bible, it was the word of God, but Jews and Christians deliberately, in order to oppose Islam, they changed that. They removed things which were referenced to Prophet Muhammad and made changes. So this book which exists as the Bible is not the real Bible. That was one of the reasons that the world of Islam was not curious, really, about the European culture and so on. It took a long time that so many transformation changes in Europe would begin to, uh, to become um, a reality for the people in Islamic societies in the Middle East and so on. Partly because they, did, they were not that curious about these cultures. The cultures were defined in terms of their religion and their books, and the books are not the real books, so they didn't, they were not interested. In the world of Islam, when they want to quote from the Bible, they refer to an Islamic tradition that, for instance, Prophet Muhammad said that Jesus has said so and so. Prophet Muhammad said, or for Shia Islam, that this Imam or that Imam said that Moses has said this or that. This is the way Bible is quoted, not through the Bible. And Abdul Baha, like his courageous father in Book of Certitude, is destroying this otherization, is destroying this violence, linguistic and cultural and religious violence against the sacred text of others. For Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha, the sacred text of Christianity and Judaism was misinterpreted by the religious leaders. And this is the, the meaning of falsification. It was a falsification of meanings, not falsification of letters. And so Abdul Baha directly quotes the Bible in those works, just as he directly quotes from the Quran. It's creating a new culture. You have to put yourself in the shoe of a Westerner who had these images of Islam, now has accepted Baha'u'llah, and is new to the Baha'i faith. It's a new spiritual culture emerging in North America. And now is receiving these tablets, constantly quoting Quran, as well as Bible and so on. It would be uh, completely a reorientation of identity and worldview. Another example is that the tablets are written um, 
during the March of 1916 and 1917, and, and some of them go to even up to May. But the beginning of the tablets, the first tablet and the second tablet are written March 25th and March 26th, or March 26th and March 27th. I don't remember right now, one of them. And that March 26th is five days after Nowruz, right? It's five days as spring has started. But Nowruz is such an important phenomenon for Iranians, for Persians. And Baha'u'llah has made this Iranian celebration of the Iranian New Year, the beginning of the Iranian New Year, one of the fundamental aspects and principles of the Baha'i faith. So what Abdul Baha does in the first tablet and in the second tablet, he begins both tablets by congratulating and giving, you know, happy news of Nowruz to the Baha'is of North America, to the Canadians and to Americans who had no idea what is Nowruz. Who are Iranians really? I mean, they are now becoming Baha'is so they know something. But the idea of Iranian, if, as I mentioned, you should not think of the United States or Canada in terms of the present, that the mayor, mayor sent, I don't know, congratulations or happy no rules or things like that to Iranian communities because there are so many Iranians everywhere. At that time, there was none. It was a totally unknown entity for, for the people. And yet, Abdul Baha begins the tablet intentionally that is writing for Baha'is of North America, none of them Persian. And he begins by uh, speaking about Nowruz and elevating it to the higher spiritual principle. He says that any day that we remember God and, that, and we act in order to promote the will of God on earth is a day of feast, is a no rules, is a day of celebration. And that all days should become a no rules, all days should become a feast and so on. Con con constantly in these tablets, he's bringing east and west into a harmonious unity. Tablets of, uh, of the divine plan are tablets of encouragement. For Abdul Baha, this is the moment of the days of God. He has this spiritual understanding of the world. And for that reason, he's filled with hope. Hope, hope ultimately is a spiritual concept. Hopelessness ultimately is rejection of a spiritual concept. If you truly believe that there is a God, if you truly believe that there is a spiritual reality, that humans, the world, are ultimately spiritual, and history ultimately is realization of these spiritual potentials out of this facade of material body and material uh, appearance, if you really believe in those things, you would be filled with hope. History for you is the process of the realization of the glory of God on earth. History becomes a process of overcoming estrangement and realization of unity in diversity eventually. That is the principle of a spirit and a spiritual orientation. And in hidden words, Baha'u'llah says that the sword of transgressions has severed uh, the tree of your hope. It's in hidden words. Probably this is almost the way Guardian has translated it. Seif esyan shajarei omid etura qat nemude. Hope, omid, is ultimately a spiritual principle. And hopeless, you look at the world and with the events happening in the world, of course, you should not blame anybody for that. But cynicism increasingly is becoming dominant. Pessimism and cynicism. The culture of the tablets of divine plan is the exact opposite. It's a tablet of optimism, of hope, 
an encouragement. He, he, he knows that the Baha'is of North America are few in number. They are not that many. But he doesn't emphasize this cynical culture that these impersonal institutions of the world would crush the individual and individuals can do nothing and nothing can be changed. For him, it is the exact opposite. These behinds of North America are like disciples of Jesus. And these individuals with the power of the spirit, they can transform the world. Whatever he talks, he talks with encouragement. He talks about California. Immediately, California becomes such a beautiful place. I mean, it is a beautiful place. But for Abdul Baha, this material, geographic beauty becomes linked to a spiritual beauty. He finds it similar to the Holy Land. But then he emphasizes that California should become like Holy Land, namely Moses, prophets uh, of Israel, and Jesus would emerge from that place, and the message of God would go to the whole world, affect the whole world from Palestine. And he says that California, just as materially, in terms of climate, in terms of geography, mountains, trees, and so on, has resemblance to that, it has to become equally the place where the message of God would emerge from that and take over the world. He talks about the Midwest, how he defines it. Midwest is the heart of the United States. A heart, of course, becomes a symbol of the true spiritual reality of human being. Is the seat of God, is the throne of God, heart. Everything that he touches, he's talking about geography, he talks about different parts of, for instance, United States or Canada. But immediately, he makes it full of hope, full of encouragement. And that's the culture of his spirit. I've, I finish my discussion by a brief reference to what he calls three conditions for the success of a teacher. Tablets of Divine Plan wants to create teachers of the Baha'i faith. But this word teaching or tabliq or other words like diffusion of the fragrance, the breath of God and, and the like. But the normal word is tabliq, teaching. It's translated as teaching. Tabliq, its immediate meaning is conveying information which has its root in, particularly in Quranic statements where Prophet Muhammad is defined to have the, the mission of Prophet Muhammad is balaq, namely to convey the message, whether people accept it or not. So tabliq is conveying the message, informing, giving the glad tidings. But for Baha'u'llah, it has also another meaning. And so the concept of teaching in Baha'i faith fundamentally changes. In one of his tablets, Baha'u'llah talks about a person who is mature, baliq, as opposed to embryo. In the embryonic stage, you have spiritual capacities, but they have not been developed. You have intellect, but the intellect is potentiality. It has not been realized. The stage of maturity is a stage of a spiritual consciousness, of development of reason, of emergence of spiritual powers. After that, he says that a true mature person is a truly mature person is a person who himself, herself becomes mature and helps others to become mature. The word tablik now, which is translated as teaching, now means not just conveying information, but helping others to become mature. And it fits, of course, with everything that Baha'u'llah says, everything that the Bab says, everything that Abdul Bab says, because the Baha'i faith is not giving a new message, imposing it on the world. For Baha'u'llah, what he says 
is the reality of our soul. This is what we know. This is our truth. It's just we have forgotten our spiritual reality. The whole point of teaching is to help us to recognize the spiritual truth which exists within us, to remember it, to rediscover it, is a process of recognition, remembrance. So it's very dialectical process. Uh, the way Socrates, for instance, would, would teach. For the Baha'i faith is teaching, but, but teaching is not, it's not this arbitrary giving slogans, bothering people, helping others through love, through tolerance, through mutual investigation of truth. Abdul Baha emphasizes that the process of teaching should not be in the form that I know more than you, I have the truth you do not have, and now I'm telling you about this. He says that it should be a process of mutual independent investigation of truth. But this process of teaching for Abdul Baha, according to these tablets, can be su successful if three conditions are realized. The first condition is says steadfastness to the covenant. Covenant only makes sense with regard to a spirit. We don't make a covenant with a dead material entity, do you? We make a covenant, a social contract with an you know, entity which is not alive, which doesn't have consciousness. Covenant is the dialogue, is the agreement of two minds, of two consciousness. The fact of covenant, which is so central in Baha'i faith, is the expression of the fact that human beings become partners with God. I love this in the hidden words Today I was reading hidden words. That's why I, I say a number of things about hidden words. Whatever has, has come to my mind, I have become excited, so it just comes in my discussion. Bahá'u'lláh calls human beings in varieties of ways. I mean, God is discussing. Um, but one of them is very unique and new. He says, oh, my brothers. God is speaking to people, humanity, and calls them not my children, because that has precedence from Judaism, Christianity, and other places, but my brothers. We are brothers of God. We are brothers of God because we have affinities with God. What God wants to do is to speak and through these words of God, through these words of revelation, that it transform. But words are realms of a spirit, realm of consciousness. God who speaks, who commands, this is the beginning of the book of Kitab Aqdas, the most holy book, the first duty. What God prescribes, the first thing that God prescribes, the original Arabic word is the first word that God writes, kataba. But the act of writing, God writes, and we have to recognize. But both are of the same nature. We are brothers of God. We are images of God. God writes, and we understand, and we recognize. Hidden words is a discourse of love. We are the servants of God, but at the same time, we become children of God. But at the same time, here, and this is very unique, I never noted that. I noted that today. We become brothers of God. Covenant is among brothers. Divine covenant with humanity is recognition of human beings as partners with God, as consciousness. But then covenant consists of two parts. Recognition of the sovereignty of God and the divine revelation and the authority of manifestation of God 
And the other affirmation of the spiritual reality of humans as partners with God, which means, from a Baha'i point of view, means the principle of democratic institutions, democratic governance in Baha'i faith, and at the same time, the principle of covenant means authority of Baha'u'llah, authority of Abdu'l-Baha, authority of Shoghi Effendi and the like. Combination of these two principles defines the principle that Abdu'l-Baha so much is emphasizing, principle of covenant. Baha'is of North America, in order to be successful in promoting peace, one of the elements which is necessary is to be steadfast to the principles of the covenant, both elements. No Baha'i should reject the, uh, the equality of the faithful, and so nobody can say, I am the priest of the Baha'is, and all the Baha'is should follow me, like what Ibrahim Khairullah did. Or to reject the authority and sovereignty of the revelation of God, of Baha'u'llah, in this case, Abdul Baha, who was the center of the covenant. Together, these two principles are inseparable from each other. That becomes the principle of covenant in the context of a spiritual definition of reality. The second condition, he says that the Baha'i community should be united, should love each other and should be united. How we can create peace in the world if the community that we belong to itself is devoid of, of peace. It is a hypocrisy. That's why Abdul Baha emphasizes so much mutual love and unity within the Baha'i community. That is a precondition of the success of teaching, the success of bringing unity to the world, of bringing culture of peace to the world. This is very important and it is central in all religions. Clerics of different religions don't want to become conscious of this or to share it. Quran is adamant in a number of statements that defines anybody who divides the religion of God into different sects and believes that his sect is the right and the other sects are not right. Quran defines all these people as mushrikin, namely polytheists, those people who join partners with God. In Quran, nothing is worse than Moshek, than the person who is polytheist, person who joins partner with God. But Quran is defining one of the meanings of Moshek, polytheist, a person who divides his own religion into different sects, is happy with his own sect, and rejects other sects. La takunu min al Moshekin al this is exactly statement in the Quran and a number of statements like that. Don't be from the Moshekin, from the polities, those who divide their own religion into different sects. And then each party, each sect is happy with their own ideas. History of religions, unfortunately, religion had, had been there in order to bring love and unity, but the misinterpretation of religion usually has led to a lot of divisions within the religion itself, which meant that up to even right now, uh, most people in various religions, instead of being promoters of unity and peace in the world are busy hating members of their own religion. And finally, the third condition that Abdul Baha emphasizes, he says detachment in Gita. Detachment in Baha'i writings has new meanings. Detachment, of course, the heart of that is a spiritual orientation that you consider the material aspects of life, selfish aspects of life, as uh, 
uh, issues which should be transcendent and the goal of life should be the moral and spiritual principles which affirm the unity and interconnectedness of everything. So this is a main element of this culture of detachment, which is very important for Abdul Baha. And one of the meanings of that is that if you become a Baha'i teacher, this should not become a basis of occupation. This should not become a quest for pecuniary possessions. When spiritual values and material financial values are mixed together, whenever the clerics, for instance, become the political leaders, that's what always happens. Spiritual principles, interests, and material financial interests, and so on, become mixed. The result is destruction of religion. So he wants people to be teachers, but he wants detached de teachers. But detachment in Baha'i writings has two other meanings. These, these, are, these are in the writings of Baha'u'llah. Not, well, there is a one tablet which he talks about this that is not translated, not even in, in its original published in, uh, in Arabic. Um, what Baha'u'llah says is that the second meaning of detachment is that you go and work and you do not become dependent on others for your sustenance. This is the exact opposite of the traditional concept of detachment in some Sufi circles, not in all of them. Which they taught that if I'm detached from the material world, from everything other than God, it means that I shouldn't work. That to trust that God somehow would provide for me. And this more or less meant that wandering around and begging and becoming dependent on others, this was defined as detachment. Of course it's not detachment. It is the essence of attachment. It is the essence of the worst forms of attachment, the essence of dependency on others and exploitation of others. So Baha'u'llah, while he emphasizes principle of detachment, he makes it, this detachment as a fundamental element of the necessity of defining labor, work, as worship, because it is a spiritual principles. It's only humans who really work. Labor, work, in the way that we understand, is a human phenomenon. And, and, and for that reason, it becomes a truly a worship when it is done with the right attitude and interest and, and the like. The final meaning of detachment, um, and the end of my uh, selective talk, is the principle that all over the writings of Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha is being discussed. The entire hidden works, the entire book of certitude, uh, the entire mystic writings of Baha'u'llah and so on are affirmation of this meaning of detachment. Detachment here becomes a principle of the method of understanding the truth. In order to understand the truth, you have to become detached from everybody and everything, all prejudices around you, everything that the clerics have told you, everything that the experts tell you, everything that your parents tell you, everything that from your childhood, your culture has brainwashed you. You have to put all of these into parentheses and start to think for yourself. Detachment from all but God, now in the writings of Baha'u'llah has a new meaning. And the meaning becomes what Abdul Baha calls it, independent investigation of truth. The entire Iran is this, this principle. It's emergence of a culture in which individuals emerges uh, with autonomy from the immediate culture, immediate assumptions, not conformity to everything that the group says. And of course, for Baha'u'llah, this true realization of detachment, namely seeing things with your own eyes, not with the eyes of my servants, which is beginning of hidden words in which he's talking about justice and fairness. That means ultimately not to be selfish, but means to be universalistic. So seeing things with your own eyes means to be liberated from all prejudices, 
from particularistic definitions of the self. And that means to have, to see things from a universalistic perspective. And that means to see things from the point of view of God. With the eyes of God, you look at everything. Uh, again, we come back to that spiritual principle and a spiritual interpretation of reality. So detachment becomes the third precondition of successful teacher, promoter of, of peace. But now this concept is so complex and multi-layered, which has um, no precedence for that in the traditional ways that this concept was defined. Thank you very much for uh, patiently uh, uh, sitting there and listening. And I forgot what time I started. I tried to check how long I have been talking, but I forgot when I started, so it, it was useless. So I just continued. Um, I'm very happy that there is no question. <laughs> See you later. <laughs>